<laughs> and he will share more with us on that topic. But I have a couple of housekeeping things I want to go over first. First of all, the previous four lectures are available here at the library to be checked out. They're DVDs, and you may check them out here and listen to them. Tonight we're also recording, and that one will be available when it's produced to be checked out from the library. The next... Um, lecture will be Monday, March 19th, and the topic is the four tasks of joy. So mark that one on your calendar. If you want to be included on the email list, you can sign the page at the back. Please put your name and your email so I know how to enter you into my system, not just the email. And then we have something available to us now that we didn't have five years ago, and for better or worse, that's Facebook. We have a Facebook group. It's called T. Tate's Blue Door Portal. And right now it's an open group because I want people to be able to find it and you know, become members of that group. But I'm going to close the group so that our dialogue is, is private. It doesn't show up in the news feed. It will only show up to other members of the group. I think that's probably the best format for that group. So you can just search TTA's Blue Door Portal and find it and then click Join Group. And one of us will add you to the group. We'll also announce the future dates and times of other lectures and other events coming up through that group. But it's really a nice forum for us to interact with each other. And again, we didn't have that last time. And these lectures are to prompt us to engage with each other and to talk about the topics that Timothy brings up. And so I expect a lot of great dialogue on that group after tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Timothy Tate. Thank you, Betsy. Good evening. Welcome. Glad you stormed through the night, or the night stormed you here, or blew you here. Maybe you were in Cincinnati earlier, and suddenly you're in Bozeman. Who knows how this works? But I'm glad you're here, and I would like to talk to you this evening about where we started five years ago, and that really caught my attention when 2012 clicked over. Uh, I love mythologies, and I love prophecies, and certainly have been interested in and studied the Mayan prophecy about the value of or the cycles of time. And when 2012 clicked over on the calendar, it kind of caught my attention. I hadn't really been thinking about it, but suddenly I realized, well, when was it then? We last sat together and talked about these things, and it was five years ago. And that was just like, how can that be? I don't know if any of you feel time accelerating, or if it's just me, but man, that was what? And so uh, we had also done four lecture series, as uh, Betsy mentioned, in 07, and then in 08, we think it was 08, can't quite remember, we did one about the dignity in hard times and addressed what it might be like to live through 
hard times and have some dignity in that experience. We'll uh, also have that uh, DVD available in the library, uh, and we're going to make some more copies of the DVDs we've had because some interest has kicked in about those, and so those will be available here soon. And like Betsy said, we'll do one more this year called The Four Tasks of Joy. And that sounds perhaps like a paradox, but you know, happiness is fairly easy. Joy takes some work. And that's, that's kind of funny, and I'll talk about that later. But I want to pick up and review just briefly where we left off in 07. Um, and that is with the idea that there was an archetypal shift of consciousness. So that came on the heels of a dream that came through in November 6th of 06. And if you remember, it was an image of a hand holding an old dry stick and drawing in the sand 11HR. And I put that on a tablet up here, and we imagined that that had something to do with the 11th hour. And we talked about what the 11th hour meant, and that is some call to action. Well, then a couple things happened, if you remember correctly. It was kind of the 11th hour. Um, we had an economic collapse within a year. One of our producers, who put on the first lecture series, David Arnott lost his life on a cold road in, outside of a small town by Judith Gap. One of our dear members of the community, Eric Albright, lost his life. Uh, the 11th hour came true for me. I was diagnosed with stage three cancer. The kind of economic collapse that happened the polarization of the political parties, the Arab Spring. These are some of the highlights of what's happened, or the lowlights, however you want to see it, over that period of time. And so it's confusing to a person like myself who has powerful dreams and works with the likes of the quality of people that are assembled here this evening and has listened to your stories and the community stories for 30 years to sometimes wonder whether or not it's just my stuff and I'll own it. The 11th hour was, yeah, get on your cancer treatment, brother, and knock it out of town. That's okay, I've got that. But it's also like, well, it wasn't just that. And so here I am again going, okay, uh, not that I've been told to talk to you, I'm not saying that, but no, really, now is the time to mature. So there is a need on my part to share with you the kind of psychological ingredients of maturity. So where we left off was when we talked about now is the time and the 11th hour, we talked about the shift of consciousness from the manic, masculine, in charge of everything, running everything, controlling everything, dominating, whether you can see it in a patriarchal way, or an aggressive way, or a greedy way, or a, a dominant way. That whole kind of archetypal field, and when I say archetype, I don't mean to say anything other than the premise that Carl Jung talked about, that there is a collective unconscious, which is the sum total of all the dreams and myths and stories and inner work that has been done by the planet, not just the humans, and I'll get to that. Uh, since we've been thinking, dreaming, wondering, and from that pool, and he used the ocean as a metaphor for that, not a stream or a pond, that the depths of the ocean holds these currents that come in waves that break the surface. Sometimes they're ripples and sometimes they're tsunamis. I believe we're in the middle of a tsunami right now. 
of archetypal change, meaning simply that it's confusing, it's conflicted, it's exciting, it's dynamic. Old forms are falling by the way, new forms are taking shape. And we talk that like saying it was from Hermes or Mercury, the gods of Greece and Roman times of communication. The more you know, the better you're off idea. And certainly that's convincing. You know, Betsy got me to go on Facebook, for goodness sakes. <laughs> I never thought I'd do that. Um, access, information, connectivity, very convincing, very powerful, right? But the other form of information has to do with a more comprehensive, soulful, light-based information, where it has to do more with the sunset and the sun and a meditative state, a sense of the feminine, a nurturing power, and we call that aurora. Since that kind of idea came to me last year from December, well actually from January to May of last year, a fable came to me about aurora. Uh, it downloaded in five days, so to speak, uh, from December 10th to December 14th of 010, and then I wrote it for six months, and that will be available in May for you to read and access as well. But it was like this thunderstorm of a fable. I just kept up with it. You've heard this before, whether it be creativity in music or art. You get seized by something, and Aurora came and told me a story about the shift that was occurring. It's like crazy talk, right? But it happened, and I can't deny that, and I'm going to share it with you, uh, and you'll be able to access it, because it's, it's a trippy story. Uh, she's a 15-year-old girl who was born and raised in Mammoth Hot Springs. Uh, her dad's a, a backcountry ranger. Her mom teaches at Gardner High. And this uh, wolverine from Glacier came down and escorted her on a journey. His name was Jake, and he wears the taser. <laughs> Get the feel for it. So it's this, this flow that we kind of, that I was seized by in December of 06. We had the lecture series. We talked about the archetypal shift. We talked about perception is not reality which is kind of a strange thing to say because for so long as a phenomenologist, a student of psychology and philosophy and phenomenology is, you're so cute, <laughs> is how you know what you know. How do you know what you know? Because you're sure convinced of it once you know it. And that's a kind of bumpy ride after that. So perception though, is reality, because that's all I can do. I, I perceive reality, my past experiences, my assumptions, my beliefs, dictate my perceptions. We gave stories, as you've probably read and accounted for, where when three masting ships with conquistadors came to the coasts of the Bahamas, native people couldn't see it. They were brought out by the shaman in a boat to touch it, because they couldn't see what that was. That's a dramatic example of how perception can dictate reality. But we made the, I made the point that perception is not reality. And that's an evocative thought. So we played with that. And finally, we thought about how if we use evolution as a metaphor for our organic continuing growth as a species, that you can't mature or evolve if you're afraid. So unafraid minds evolve. Frightened minds tend to repeat themselves and stay stuck. So <clears throat> that's where we left off. We talked about uh, in that series as well, our shadows. I'll talk a bit about that. We talked about the difference between ego, character, and persona, and we ended up with the yoga of openness. How do you stay open? 
How do you keep your antenna clean? How do you manage the flow of information, be it in the form of dreams, emotions, experiences, or thoughts? So that brings us to tonight's topic, and I'm going to kick off with a rather complex, but you'll get it here quickly, I'm sure, and somewhat annoying premise, and it comes from Carl Jung. And I couldn't cite it for you. I found it when I was reading his collected works, and I didn't cite where I got it from. But it's the idea that maturity is the capacity to hold the tension of irreconcilable paradox. That's the definition we're going to work with that defines maturity. It's not about getting older. It's not about getting wiser. It's not about getting more experiences. It's about the psychological capacity to hold the tension of irreconcilable paradox. The adolescent within us has to have the black and white. Is it this or that? Tell me. I can't handle any tension. What's the truth? I know the truth. You don't. You're right. I'm wrong. Whatever. The back and forth of that polarized idea of what's good or bad, right or wrong. <clears throat> this brings to the conversation the idea that the ultimate irreconcilable paradox <coughs> that matures us or crushes us is the force of our ego, our need to control and understand everything and be on top of things and know where this is going and have a sense of what this is all about and security, the ego as a package of controlling ideas, beliefs and attitudes and behaviors in relationship with the chaos of the unconscious. That's the ultimate irreconcilable paradox. And we're in it every day. You got this wee little ego fighting the quantum of the unconscious force field that's surrounding you and coming at you 24-7. That's an irreconcilable paradox. How are you going to control that? How are you going to manage that to your satisfaction? It's a bit of a struggle. So, given that definition that maturity is the capacity to hold the tension of irreconcilable paradox, what are some ways, some tools that we might talk about, that I'm going to talk about first and then we can talk about, that would help us with the tension of this paradox? So, I'm going to talk about five tools, and then we'll see where we land. <clears throat> so far, so good? Okay. Good, good. Um, when Susan got this to begin with, I thought it was like regressing into a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it, but now I kind of like it. <laughs> so, whatever. Okay, <clears throat> the first tool of how to be with the process and tension of maturity. The first one is to release resentments. In other words, you can't mature unless da 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 da. The first one of those da da does is resentments. No matter how justified your resentments are, no matter how committed you are to those resentments, no matter how well you can explain and defend why you've been betrayed, what the problem is, what the resentment is, what the protest is, what's unfair, what's messed up, it doesn't matter. 
As long as we're holding resentments, we can't find the necessary energy, and it takes energy to mature, to go through the process of holding this tension of the irreconcilable paradox between what we think we should be experiencing or have or know and this surge of the unconscious chaos. Uh, you know, the, I think like this, I think about this every day, and that's a problem, but here it is. <clears throat> you know, first of all, we're spinning around at 17,000 miles an hour. Got that? Then we're traveling around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour. And then the Milky Way is headed that way at a million miles an hour. That's happening. And then on the micro level, way, 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 way down, the energetic reality is so wiggly and so unspottable or knowable, we call them quanta, and the multi-billion dollar CERN nuclear collider is trying to find that little what's now called God particle or Higgs boson or that small little string <laughs> that's behind everything else. So here we're going like crazy through the universe and we're vibrating like mad and your ego is trying to make sense of this and control it. How are we doing? <laughs> You add resentments to that, and you're in the hole. So a resentment to me, and we all have them, um, when I work with couples in our practice, that's the first barrier that has to be gotten through. If you're resenting something about your partner, you're not going to be able to communicate. You're not going to be able to solve problems. You're always going to go back to that resentment because you're justified in it. You got them. You got the goods. You believe the justified resentment and it blocks the capacity to be present with the other. <clears throat> so, the degree to which we hold our resentments is the extent to which we stay in a state of immaturity of adolescence. Because if you want to know about resentments, talk to an adolescent. I hate her. I hate him. I hate, you know, just, ah! The drama is an expression of resentment. Okay. The second variable in this matrix I'm laying out tonight about how we psychologically mature and hold the tension of irreconcilable paradox in a way that matures us rather than crushes us, is that we each have a responsibility to manage our moods. This is big in a mood disorder society. What's the number of people? You know, we're all taking different forms of medications. We're all taking different forms of looking for relief in different ways. There's lots of different ways we can talk about how to manage moods. All I'm saying is that unless you take responsibility for managing your own depression, your own anxiety, your own bipolarity tendencies, your own fears, your own panic, you'll stay in a place of depending on others or blaming others, which is an adolescent position. It's not my responsibility, it's yours that I messed up. We'll use blame. We'll use anything we can to avoid taking responsibility for our own moods. And I don't know if this is news, but men are as moody as women, okay? <laughs> We're all the same there. Men hide it, reveal it, show it differently. There's different cycles in women, there's different cycles in men, but we're equally as humans 
challenged by the brain's biochemistry and the nervous system's inheritance and the overstimulation of modern times that creates a mood imbalance throughout every day, throughout weeks, throughout months, mood imbalance. <clears throat> Lots of ways to talk about what that is. You each have your own way of understanding that. All I'm saying is you have to take responsibility for your own moods. You can't have your mate solve it for you. You can't have me solve it for you. You can't have religion solve it for you. You can't have medication solve it for you. You have to go into a way of understanding your own rhythm of moods, take responsibility for it, and when you're in the mood, have a way to be with it so you don't act it out. That's where it gets mean. That's where it gets sad. We act out our mood disorder usually on the people we're closest to and throw love in there somehow. If you really love me, you would know that it's you that's causing me to be all messed up. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> because it's so close, you know, and, and the person nearest and dearest to you is the one that you experience the mood, their moods, and so my mood and your mood have a relationship. And it's kind of funky. And it keeps you immature because you are now protesting. You're resenting. They, that's how those two interact together. So, taking responsibility for your moods, for my moods. Um, my history, my genetic history, my psychological history has to do with that sense of what is now popularly called bipolarity or manic depression. The excitement and thrill and intensity of creativity or of insight or of this life we're living, which is just, if you hadn't noticed, wild. Get all excited and and evoked and, and intense and like I'm doing right now, you know? And it can kind of take over. And then whew, fall into the trough of despair and depression and loneliness. And there's a wave frequency to that. There's a pattern to that that's taken me years to understand. And so when it starts to come on, and by the way, for the record, I'm not bipolar one, I'm bipolar two. <laughs> the diagnosis gets very screwy, and I don't even know if I really am. I'm just saying that these extremes are what caused me to act out without being aware of what I was doing and cause pain and suffering for those I love. And that isn't mature. Because the irreconcilable paradox I'm experiencing is this intensity and then this despair. And how I learned how to hold the tension of that is there's a sense of when that starts to come on, there's a certain feel to that. There's a certain taste in the mouth. There's a certain vibration in the brain. And so have to retreat, have to be quiet, have to be alone. And you go through that experience within half an hour rather than convert it into a nightmare of weeks or months. Each of you know in your own heart of hearts when you're going south. It's your responsibility to own that and not blame somebody else for it or something else, no matter how justified you are. Okay? That's number two. Going on to number three. Five tools. We're hitting number three now. 
It's a lot like managing your moods, but this one is containing your shadow. Okay? We dedicated a whole talk to that. I'm going to just review that briefly because it's the key to the darkest place of all that I'm talking about. So when I say to contain your shadow, the shadow is composed of all that you have banished from your own conscious mind. And more often than not, that content, that content is driven by your sense of feeling not good enough or inadequate. Okay? So there is no worse feeling than feeling not good enough. And unfortunately, for the last several thousand years, it's been used, shame has been used to control behavior because it's very effective. If I can make you feel inadequate as a parent to a child, I've got you. If I can make a partner feel not good enough, I got you. If I can use a sense of being not good enough as a religion, I got gotcha. you. It's a powerful state. Nobody wants to feel inadequate. And as we've talked about, there are six ways that you cover up that sense of inadequacy because it's unbearable. Talk about an unbearable tension. You try to be perfect, you withdraw. You get enraged and throw a temper tantrum. You blame. You try to get the superior position. Or we have contempt for what makes us feel not good enough. In our society, perfectionism has kind of won the day. Because if you're better than everybody, if you're perfect, you're better than everybody who can be shame you. Withdrawal is a way of, if you're feeling inadequate or not good enough, or you, that you've blown something, you'll retreat. If somebody is showing you in the experience that you're not good enough, like on a golf course, you know, <laughs> and you miss the stroke and you miss the ball, you know, men tend to fly off the handle right then. They get really angry. They, I've seen guys throw a golf club farther than they hit the ball. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. You know, that temper tantrum, rage, when you feel inadequate. The blame we've talked a bit about, the superior position. If I can somehow feel like I'm better than you, that I don't feel inadequate. But that's a full-time job, and it doesn't pay well. And finally, contempt. So. Containing your own shadow means that you're willing to take responsibility for your own darkness, and that is going to have everything to do with how you feel inadequate. So in order to mature, we're talking about the capacity to bear the tension of that inadequacy without placing it or projecting it onto others. For instance, if I'm not feeling good enough, you're going to have a lousy day because I'm going to make it miserable for you because I'm not feeling good. And what do we say? Misery loves company. If I'm not feeling strong and in my own sense secure, I'm going to look for trouble to distract. It'll be the drama of an adolescent. So what we're talking about is that not only is it time to mature as individuals, but it's time to mature as a culture. Because we've been an adolescent culture. Some say that the collapse of this economic experience we've been through is the initiation into a more mature culture. A more mature economic system, a more mature health system, a more mature way of being together because you have to go through a period of initiation and suffering to move from one stage of life to another. 
So it seems that we as a culture are being worked as well as individually. <clears throat> okay, the fourth point is in order to mature, we have to nurture nature. Two forms of nature here. Your individual nature, which is your individual character, not your ego. And I'll talk a bit about that here in a second. But your character, and nature is what's happening outside tonight. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> the power of nature. In other words, the adolescent uses nature. Did that just rattle? Excellent. See, that's what I'm talking about. Freaks me out. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Yeah, when the magpies start talking to you, then you know you're making progress. Um, seriously. <laughs> A raven on the lamppost on South Church in Lam and uh, Mendenhall this morning talked in a way that I've never heard. It was... It was fantastic. We had a great conversation. There's a book called Mink River that a friend of mine turned me on to, which is a magical realism story set in the Northwest, where one of the uh, main characters is a raven. His name is Moses. And this nun taught the raven how to talk, raised it from a hatchling. And so the raven carries on important conversations. In the story I wrote, there's not only a wolverine, there's a dolphin, there's a salmon, there's a chickadee. We have lost our connection with nature in such a way that has devastated our capacity to feel at home in our own bodies. We have so separated ourselves from the conversation going on in the planet, in the leaves, in the rain, in the water, in the storm, in the wind, that we think we know something about how everything works. We are so divorced from our own nature that we believe our personality is truer than our character. We believe our own shame complex, which is what the personality is. You put all those six things together in a network, and that's called your personality. Our persona, our personality is constantly working to protect us from feeling inadequate. What a deal, because it bought the lie that we're inadequate. And now I spend the rest of your life trying to cover that up. There's a bargain. That has nothing to do with nature. There isn't one inadequate raven. I, I promise that. There's not one inadequate wolverine. So the connection with nature is not some sort of epic climb Mount Everest. It's about taking, and some of you know this, a moment every 20 minutes to an hour and going outside. Um, I, between every session, I take 15 minutes and walk around the neighborhood. You guys know that about me. And on that walk, <clears throat> no matter if it's cold or hot or rainy or snowy or anything, I break the trance on an hourly basis. Because the trance of immaturity, the trance of the unconscious, is so convincing that you don't even know that you are out of touch. Whether it be on a screen or whether it be on a project, so all I mean by nature is the capacity to get up and go outside. <clears throat> we live in <clears throat> a wonderful environment, and so many of you, us, are so outdoor-oriented. That's a great thing. And so many of us are able to see 
the beauty of nature all the time and this wild weather that we have here always reminds us. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about walking out of the room you're in on an hourly basis and going and hearing and smelling and seeing and touching and listening to the way the world is humming and talking to you all the time. When I walked around the block, that raven started it off. Then the magpie picked up the conversation about 20 feet down the road. Then a bunch of sparrows came through in the trees like they do, and they gathered and were carrying on. Then a car drove by real fast and splashed me with water. That was wet. You know, my hat blew off, the wind gusted. The siren of an ambulance and a fire truck shot by, my ears are ringing. Watched a guy riding a bicycle right at me on the sidewalk. And I'm pretty militant about this. I don't move. It's a sidewalk. It really pisses me off. I'm kind of on a campaign about that. <laughs> Bicycle is a vehicle, road, sidewalk, pedestrian. Anyway, so I'm not moving. You know. Back to resentment. Back to resentment. <laughs> Pisses me off, Susan. Oh, get real immature in that moment. So we have a little standoff. But I, I don't flip them off anymore. I'm making progress. Um, and I'm just at the corner. Now I'm turning the corner. And I smell the coffee, of Rockford coffee there. Oh, I want a latte. You know? And I see this beautiful car go by with a bunch of people in it laughing and, you know, and then Another gust of wind comes and some papers fly off. You see what I'm saying? It's the experience. You're welcome. <laughs> we can get out of here. It's, it's what time is it? Yeah, about 10 to. I've got about 10 more minutes to go on this conversation. So all I'm saying by that nature is that we are connected to everything and everything is connected to us, cliche, but maybe in some ways you're understanding what I'm saying. But most importantly, maturity is the capacity to connect to your own character. Can you find your character in the debris of your persona? Can you find the character in the conflict of the ego with everything else that's chaotically storming you? Can you find your character, your nature? What is that nature like? What is your character like? A hint. It's effortless. When you're in your character, you don't have to try to be or do anything. This little one is in her character, his character. Is it a boy or girl? Yeah, boy. Boy. What's your name? Jovial. 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 Brilliant. Yeah. All right, Jovial. We'll talk later. Um, that's what's so appealing to children, about children, about old people. They're characters. They're in their character. The old people have worn out. They don't give a damn anymore. <laughs> They're tired. We're all getting there. We're close. I think I'm there. <laughs> Children don't care because they don't know any better. That's what character looks like. Animals have character. Dogs who have been trained, I don't know. Domesticated animals, I don't know. It gets a little interesting. But you get a sense that nature is wild, unpredictable, and yet in harmony with itself. 
The weather doesn't throw a fit, it's just being itself. Character doesn't try to compensate for anything, it just is. So when we talk about nurturing your nature, does you have the courage to allow yourself to be in touch with that dynamic force that you don't have to apologize for, explain, defend, or justify? Your nature. The fifth point is you have to have a dedicated dreaming practice. Because I'm here to tell you, the information that you need to know is not coming through Fox News or the internet. Just telling you this. It's coming through your dreams. And I'll take a stand on this. I'm not backing down on this one. And we're shifting from, and we'll do a presentation on this later in, in April, but shifting from the idea of I had a dream to I see a dream. It's one of, last, of, of my mentor James Hillman's last kind of concepts that he laid down. Let's move past the idea of having a dream, possessing a dream, to can you see when you're unconscious? What are you seeing at night when you are asleep and unconscious? We've talked about in the past that there's three levels of dreams. And I stick with this as well. There's the copper dream that works out your day residue. Those are the funky ones that go nowhere and everywhere. First dream cycle every night. Then in the second dream cycle, more in the middle of the night, you have a silver dream, which is a four-part dream. Suddenly I'm here, then it shifts to there, and that addresses your persona. And then the gold dream is the dream that comes on and you can never forget. It's in that realm. The gold dreams are now, in my experience, full on. For instance, last night, and I think maybe Tina had some dreams that you were talking about. We all had dreams last night, but the one I always am interested before I do a lecture, what are the dreams going to tell me? What are they going to show me? Last night, I, had, I watched hundreds of grizzly bears run up against a wall and crush each other, just pile on each other, one after another after another until there's this huge pile of grizzly bears flattened against this wall. And I went up and looked at it and realized that they were all mechanical. That they were like artificial robot grizzly bears. What the hell? <laughs> because I was really sad. And I was really astonished. And then it was like, what is that? Who knows? Way past trying to interpret things. Way past, well, what does this mean? Simply seeing the image, seeing the story at night. So what I'm asking is that we have a rededication to the dream time as a way of maturing. Because no matter how, and we all know this, when we say, when we report a dream to somebody else, what, do you, what are you going to say first? I had this weird dream. That's what I hear all the time. I had this weird dream. What I'm saying is, your waking life is as weird to the dreamer <laughs> as you think your dreams are weird to your ego. It's a whole different world that is giving you information that is like another language. And how you are in relationship to the dream time is critical when we talk about maturing because it will tell you about your character. 
It'll tell you about the things that are going on beyond your ego, beyond your controlling need to be somehow in charge of your life experiences. The dreams are always broadcasting the fresh material. So dedicated dreaming is about seeing while you're unconscious. So there's outlines, by the way. I'll put them out in the back table here. All of this, just take a copy of this before you go if you want. The outline will be on the Facebook page she was talking about. This is just planting the seeds. You, I, will, I want you to kind of work with this in your own way, see what dreams you have, post them. Let's see where this goes. So um, to conclude, there are a number of tasks that I'd like to lay out. And that is, the first one is, choose your company well. Identify your tribe and develop community within it. When we talked about dignity in hard times, talked about psychological neighborhoods. Develop your own psychological neighborhood. Doesn't matter where you live. The time to hold back is past. Find your community, find your tribe, develop it. The second task is be careful not to dissipate your energy needlessly. In order to mature, you need every amp of your charge. You cannot waste your energy needlessly. The third task is I would ask you to spend three months dedicating and practicing these principles from now until the end of May. Got the resources, line them out, you can look at them, we can talk about it online, however we want to do it. Release the resentments, manage the moods, Contain the shadow, nurture your nature, dedicated dreaming, be in the deepest conversation you can find language for with your community, with your tribe, with your group, and find a way to move past this repetitive, fearful, adolescent resistance that holding the tension of irreconcilable paradox is a way of talking about, is a way of being different with. Finally, <clears throat> segueing to the next conversation, it's clear to me that the next big challenge is to wrestle with and live in joy. And that is a transition from living a spirited life that's filled with energy into a soulful life that holds the beauty of everything without having to act it out. It's a holding rather than a spirited. We are, that's a great form of life, but we'll talk about spirit and soul and happiness and joy. Moving from spirited happiness and the quest for that into a joyful holding of the tension of irreconcilable paradox. As one of the Sufis said, oh what joy to know there is no happiness in this world. <laughs> That's kind of where we're going to go next, and there's four tasks there. So the resources, we talked about the Tite's Blue Door Portal, dreams, more information on dreams, Dream w, Dreamwave or DreamWV.com, 
great online resource for information about that. That's again listed on this. <clears throat> if you want to see interviews and other films we have done, uh, our filmmaker, Keith Lockwood, has a site called Cosmic Sense. We have a number of our interviews and the Finding Ireland film on that site. And then, if you just want to kick it out, every Friday from 12 to 3, we're on KGLT. And we're playing new music, fresh music, indie music. And you can get to that at kglt.net, wherever you are. The library is now closed. We will reopen tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Sunday evening. I'd love to sample that. OK. That's what I got. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found, carrying into evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now, starting here, right in this room, when you turn around?